Hello, everyone. Glad to see you all here. It's my pleasure to introduce Brian Hassett. I met Brian Hassett as uh, actually, I came upon this child of God walking along the road in Woodstock. Um, Within about 10 minutes, he started, I'm a, I'm a Merry Prankster, one of the Merry Pranksters, and we were on tour with our 50th anniversary of the 64 trip, is where I met him. And he's telling me about having been at this conference in 82 with Ken Kesey and Abby Hoffman, God and everybody was there. So I, he's telling me he's got these notes and tapes and all this stuff, and that he uh, is going to write a book. And I said, what the hell are you waiting for? <laughs> there will never be a better time for this book to come out than right now. He locked himself away in his apartment in Toronto for, he can tell you better than me, months. And within about six months, delivered me a copy of the book. And I thought, what an amazing individual. So allow me to introduce you to Brian Hassett. Yeah! The most delicious truck ride I ever had in my life was when after the movers put all the furniture aboard and my mother went ahead in a car with Sister Nin and the movers arranged my father's easy chair at the tailgate's hem of the truck and I could sit there, lean back, smoke, sing and watch the road wind away from me at 50 miles an hour. The line on curves snaking away into the woods of Connecticut. The woods getting different and more interesting the closer we approached Old Lowell. And at dusk, as we're hitting through Westford or thereabouts, and my old white birch reappeared grieving in hill silhouettes, tears came to my eyes to realize I was coming back home to Old Lowell. It was October. It was nice out. It was wood smoke in the air. It was swift waters in the wink of silver glare. With its rose headband out yonder where Eve Star stoppered up her drooling propensities and tried to contain itself in one delimited throb of boiling light. Jack Kerouac on the road in 1941. Yeah. So welcome, huge room full of Jack and poetry and spirit-loving souls from all over the land. When I was here last year, I was struck by uh, how everybody except the locals had gone on some big road trip to come to the home of On the Road Guy. And so it seemed like road stories and a road experience was kind of what everybody coming to LCK was having. So it made sense to sort of celebrate the road. And uh, so that's what I thought we should do here in Lowell at this time. Uh, oh, and that book he was talking about. <laughs> Available now, well, copies last. <laughs> the Hitchhiker's Guide to Jack Kerouac is all about road stuff. So I thought, you know, let's bring the road into the house that we've all been covering to get us to this point. So, here's just one little road trip from this book, a hitchhiking story, of course, 1982. So, I hitchhiked from paradise to heaven. I mean, uh, Boulder to Marin using my well-read jack thumb to flip me through. Adventure host Cliff and I jumped in the Rat Pack Cadillac for the last time, and he dropped me off on 104th Street on the outskirts of Denver, and before I could even get my first sign made, some Air Force guy honks and pulls over. This is starting easy. My mom's first husband, who was killed long before I came along, uh, had been an Air Force pilot. And somehow, through the great osmosis, I could relate to this guy's world and he to mine. 
He was a straight up dude, out doing the right thing. Picking up some guy on the side of the road who was going somewhere just like he was. The wild blue yonder. Other places, other spaces, other faces by the graces. We were a hell of an odd couple. Bobby Brushcut and Prince Valiant. <laughs> Close to the same age, I was digging on the incredibly different lives we led and had led to this point. I couldn't imagine being told what time to go to bed or what time to get up and what to do with every minute of every day. And I don't think he'd know what to do without the structure of someone telling him. Yet we were totally simpatico and riffed a symphonic jam as we crossed the simple land. He dropped me off outside Fort Collins, another Colorado college town, where the pickups are easy and the roadside breezy. Of course, I was jamming on being, this being the place where Dylan's Rolling Thunder Tour was filmed and recorded for Hard Rain. And halfway had a notion to go find the stadium, but figured, ah, probably not enough of a payoff for the hike involved. And besides, about 10 minutes later, this Ernest Borgnine looking guy stopped, telling me he's heading for Cheyenne. And right away in my Kerouacian head, I started replaying Jack's bar hopping, girl chasing visit with Montana Slim during Frontier Days and on the road. So I asked this guy if he ever goes to it, and he damn near slams on the brakes and throws me out. Why the hell are you asking me that? Um, it was just mentioned in a book I was reading? Well, that couldn't be much of a goddamn book, because you're a week late, thank God. Oh, you mean it just happened? Yeah, of course it just happened, you an idiot? Well, I was just at this writer's conference in Boulder, I say, hoping that'll chill him a little. We weren't getting much news from beyond there. Boulder? You some kind of hippie? And he looks over at me, you look like a hippie. And suddenly I'm flipping from on the road to easy rider. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I just came down from Canada for some writer's courses, I say, playing my northern card and studentiness. See if that'll get him off whatever problem he had. Canada? Never been. Why would you live there? What the hell is there in Canada? Well, I said looking around, a lot of land like this. As we were surrounded by the vast views of nothingness, and there was suddenly silence as we high plains drifted across the tundra. Yeah, I suppose there is. Well, as long as you're not here for that goddamn frontier drunks. Why is that? Is it a bad thing? Goddamn right it's a bad thing. People pissing all over the fucking streets for two weeks. I get the hell out and live with my sister in Collins every year when that bunch of idiots comes to town. Turns the whole goddamn place into Disneyland for assholes. <laughs> And he went on like this for a while. And I learned everything that was wrong with people. And the country, and the world. Although I got the sense this guy had never been out of Colorado. Anyway, he finally dropped me off outside Cheyenne, assuring me how lucky I was that the fucking tourists from the east were all gone. And he smiles and waves goodbye, like he was the friendliest guy in the world who just made a new best friend. After about an hour of nothing happening under the blazing midday August sun of Cheyenne, Cheyenne, Wyoming, I started to lament the lack of tourists at Disneyland and suddenly remembered this was the least populated state in the country or something. Until finally this guy in a fancy tan Caprice Classic pulls over. And I'm thinking, he's got to be more civilized, as Huck would say, than old Ernest Borgnine. I throw my pack in the back seat and jump in the front, and the guy's got a bucket of spit beside him <laughs> and a Colt 45 on the dash, and I don't mean the beer. He turns out to be okay, but that is, he doesn't shoot me, and drives us clear across Wyoming from the desolate, endless, gray, high plains into the foothills of the Rockies again. And right away he notices me looking at the shiny long-barreled six-shooter 
and lets me sweat it out a while. <laughs> we talk about whatever, but my eyes are probably always flashing back over to it. So eventually he says, I see you noticed the gun. Don't worry, that's for niggers and assholes. You don't look like either. <laughs> that's one of those lines you don't forget. <laughs> Boulder, of course, was a liberal mecca of tolerance. Not that I ever saw any black people there. But, but in Denver, I'd heard the N-word several times, and other comments <clears throat> I'd never heard firsthand before. And they thought nothing of it. Coming from Winnipeg and Vancouver and lately Greenwich Village, Manhattan, I'd never experienced authentic, inbred, totally accepted racism before. In my world, people would name drop some hip band or philosopher or author to convey their cool to a stranger. In these parts, it seemed like you wanted to show how much you hated the N-words to prove your cool. Very weird. I, wouldn't, I would just let it pass through the air and not say a goddamn thing. When in Rome, get out alive. <laughs> and this guy seemed to have a lot of hate for other people too. And I figured he just wanted somebody to listen to his rantings. You have to become a different person to survive each of these different road plays. I don't want to think about what would happen if he knew what I thought about what he was saying. But it's part of the world, and that's what I was digging on. Who are these people? I'm sure not going to run into one on McDougal Street. They hate every person in government except Ronald Reagan. And any person who's not a wasp. And they're angry and probably go through a lot of ammo shooting at God knows what every week. It really is still the Wild West out west. Yeah! Anybody, uh, anybody know what time it is? Uh, I got 420. Okay, perfect. <laughs> you can make a, a whole Cheech and Chong routine out of Jack's uh, 420 moments and all his different books. So I thought since we're doing a show at this sacred moment, we got to tap into that well. <laughs> From on the road, when they're down in Mexico at the end. Presently, Victor's tall brother came ambling along with some weed piled on a page of newspaper. He set it on Victor's lap and leaned casually on the door of the car to nod and smile at us, hello. And Dean nodded and smiled pleasantly at him. Nobody talked, it was fine. Victor proceeded to roll the biggest bomber anybody ever saw. He rolled using brown bag paper, uh, what appeared to be a tremendous Corona cigar of tea. It was huge! <laughs> Dean just stared at it, pop-eyed. <laughs> Victor casually lit it and passed it around. To drag on this thing was like leaning over a chimney and inhaling. <laughs> It blew into your throat in one great blast of heat. And we held our breath. <laughs> and let it out simultaneously. And instantly we were all high. And the sweat froze on our foreheads. And I, I looked out the back window of the car and there's the strangest of Victor's brothers. A tall Peruvian of an Indian with a sash over his shoulder, leaning, grinning on a post too bashful to come up and shake hands. It seemed the car was surrounded by brothers, uh, for another one appeared on Dean's side. Then the strangest thing happened. Everybody became so high that usual formalities were dispensed with, and things of immediate interest were concentrated on. And now it was the strangeness of Americans and Mexicans blasting together on the desert. And more than dirt, the strangeness of seeing in close proximity the faces and pores and skins and calluses of fingers and general abashed cheekbones of a whole other world. Jack and Neil, 420 in Mexico.
Apparently, you're all supposed to vote.